Lou, are there any are there any tumor types where immunotherapy doesn't work? Um, no, and I'll, and let me be clear that that's a statement of hope, not a statement of fact. Um, and the reason why I think that my my statement is true is the following: when a cancer develops in somebody, it has basically only one enemy, and that's the body's immune system. So every cancer that grows in a human has essentially navigated a hostile immune environment. The immune system's not ineffective, it's perfectly effective, but the cancer has essentially erected defenses and solved the puzzle posed by the body's immune system. So the thing that's really neat about that is that as soon as a cancer figures out a solution, it doesn't really need to look for other solutions, you know, from an evolutionary biology perspective. It sticks with the thing that works, and that becomes the dominant clone. So if you think about it from that perspective, that which makes the cancer survive is also, by definition, the Achilles heel of the cancer. And if you can disable that dominant mechanism, you ought to be able to, uh, to have a, a meaningful effect. And I personally think what the whole PD-1, PD-L1, IPI story is about is essentially that there are some cancers where this checkpoint is the critical checkpoint. And I am pretty confident that there are going to be other checkpoints that can be interrogated and then used as as targets in other diseases. Now, in speaking of that, I wanted to talk, ask you, since you mentioned it, Roy, about to, uh, mutation load. Well, how important do you think mutation load is in terms of identifying, as almost like a biomarker, if you will, what tumors might be most sensitive to certain kinds of immune therapy manipulations? Right, I've asked our immunologists this, I guess, the first I thought would be, you know, is this a polyclonal response? And, and the sense is it probably is. Mm -hmm. So it does look that, like those tumors that have large mutation burdens you know, tend to be the ones that are the most immunogenic and the most responsive. Although we are seeing activity in, in, in tumors where we know that they're you know, driven by a single driver, but perhaps that occurs after the, the tumor, mm -hmm. some tumor cells die. But, but I do think that's something to look at. But you know, it'll be great as we get more and more of these agents out there as they enter expanded access, if we can start to sequence tumors and, and really start to do that. Or I know there are ways to even uh, identify what, is the, what antigens are the T cells recognizing. I think that is going to be something important to figure and out. You know, there's work that's been done by Rosenberg's group and Vogelstein and others looking exactly at, at that kind of uh, paradigm where there's an attempt made to tease out the immunogenic uh, uh, antigens by looking for what T cells are recognizing and trying then to develop customized therapy strategies using approaches such as the CARs or exactly. such as tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And while those are not at all similar to the checkpoint inhibitors, one can readily imagine that they could be complementary in some ways to checkpoint inhibitor strategies. And so I think that's going to be a really exciting part of the future. I agree. What do we know about either um, de novo resistance or acquired resistance to immunotherapies? Is there any, any data on, on, on that at this point? Uh, I think that we don't know enough. We were talking previously, as you know, about the, uh, the role of predictive biomarkers and how we don't really yet know what the relevant predictive biomarkers are going to be, and that looking just at something such as PDL1 expression is probably an over, overly simplistic view. Too narrow of a focus. So I think yeah. that, you know, again, going back to that evolutionary biology uh, concept that I was identifying before, when you place a, a powerful selection pressure on any population of cells, animals, roaches, whatever it's going to be, you're going to essentially kill those elements that are susceptible to that selection pressure. And the ones that are less susceptible will now find a favorable space for them to proliferate mm -hmm. and to survive. So I don't think when we get drug resistance or therapy resistance, it's because we made the cancer angry. What we did is we got rid of the well-behaved members of the society and let the ruffians uh, uh, go, go nuts. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and as we refer back to the yeah. data, data, again, as we've seen in most right. tumor types, there were clearly responses in non pd one expressing tumors. Right. There was a trend, perhaps, to a greater degree of response mm -hmm. in highly expressing pd ones but again, we're not ready to exclude those patients from trials based on expression. Well, I would agree with that. And I think that what we're going to be learning, though, is that the, this heterogeneity that cancers have, immunological, genetic, you know, you know, functional in any way you want to look at it, is going to become a critical determinant of who, who responds, how well they respond, 
and if they do relapse, how they relapse. And the challenge before us as clinical investigators and our scientific colleagues is going to be to dive down deeply and understand what some of those mechanisms are and how these selection pressures influence these processes. And I'm, I think that preclinical models can help us with this. But, you know, I think we're also going to have to figure out how to do clinical trials that allow us to interrogate some of these concepts in a prospective way as well. So it's very challenging, but really quite exciting, I think. Absolutely. So you want to talk know, about kidney cancer? I want to, well, I want to just thank, thank the, our friends in the urologic community for, for, for putting us in a situation where we don't have to use the, the, the word MVAC anymore. <laughs> well, uh, I, I, I well, think most of us would be delighted to, sort of, to, to, to move beyond, to move move beyond. beyond the cisplatin era in, uh, Absolutely. In, in, in bladder cancer. Right. What about the BCG, though? You mentioned that. Is, is that something that could be used in conjunction with well, these you, you know, needless to say, as we're thinking about combinatorial therapies, uh, when we talk about urothelial cancer, obviously, as you well know, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer is a much more prevalent disease, and it's a worldwide disease, and it's the most expensive cancer to manage. So the reality is, if you thought about economic unmet needs in cancer, that's a huge target. So the potential to use a systemic therapy, along with an intravesical immunomodulatory therapy that causes a variety of cytokine mm -hmm. storms, I think it's going to be unequivocally a fascinating area and the ability to do translational work because you can get tissue readily and study is, is going to be, I think, incredibly important. I have no doubt that's going to evolve. 